it's amazing. Someone walks up to the podium and silence happens. That's awesome. I wish that happened when I taught freshman chemistry. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin Garrell. I'm the Vice Provost of Graduate Education and Dean of the Graduate Division. And I'm so excited to welcome all of you, our contestants, our judges, and our fabulous audience, uh, to Grad Slam. Really appreciate your coming. This is the final round of the competition on our campus, but there's more after this. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the competition before we get started. And I know our contestants are very anxious to get going, so I won't take too long. The idea behind Grad Slam is to highlight the really wonderful work that graduate students are doing at UCLA. It's intelligent, it's creative, it's innovative, and it's impactful. And they now have a challenge to tell you about it, you who are not in each of their fields, because you can't be in all of their fields, and tell you about their work, get you excited about it, help you understand it, and get you as thrilled about it as they are, and uh, help you appreciate it better. So their challenge is to present their work in understandable and engaging ways, in three minutes, with no more than three slides. The first UC-wide Grad Slam was held uh, last year, 2015. It was inspired by similar competitions that are happening around the country. You've often heard of like a three-minute dissertation competition, or sometimes they're five minutes, but three, three is a little bit more challenging. The first ones in the UC were held at San Diego and Santa Barbara, Riverside, and UCSF. Uh, but last year, all the UC grad deans got together and said, we need to have it on each of our campuses, and then let's go head to head. We're a very collegial bunch, but we're also just a little bit competitive. So tonight, what we're going to do, we have 10 contestants. Uh, we're going to identify four winners. First place, second place, third place. They're going to be identified by our judging panel here, whom I'll tell you about in just a moment, and an audience choice. Okay, so you all have a role to play in determining one of our winners. Now, only the first place winner will go on to the system-wide competition. There are fabulous prizes, swag and things, of course, but also fellowships. I mean, that's the stuff that really counts. And there's fellowships here at the campus level, and then there's a big fellowship at the system-wide level as well. So I'll give a few housekeeping details to tell you how things are going to go. Uh, for family members and friends who couldn't be here tonight, we actually have a, a live broadcast of the event. Okay. I don't know if we have that up there or not. We don't. Uh, but they can watch online if they go to the Grad Division website, they can find it. Uh, we're, we're live, so it'll be on camera. There's a camera over here, and there's other things going on, cameras over there. Uh, so what that means is there's a little bit of a burden on you, the audience, right? Which means that if you're holding up your cell phone and doing selfies, you might find yourself with your selfie on your camera in the camera. So no selfie sticks, please. Thank you. Um, but if you're on social media, we encourage you to tweet, Instagram, and Snapchat away. And the hashtags are, very easy, all caps, UCLA, Grad Slam, and hashtag Grad Slam. And I think, are they displayed up there? Yes, they are. Okay. Uh, so please go ahead and get that on social media. As you may see, there's a timer clock located uh, straight ahead of me and over your shoulders uh, that all of our competitors will be able to see. It's a countdown clock, three minutes. They have exactly three minutes before a buzzer will sound. There's a penalty if they go over the time limit. So I know they've all practiced and so on. So I'm not worried about them going over time. Uh, between each presentation, our judges will have to do a little bit of scoring. And uh, I'm going to encourage them to not get too loquacious, because this isn't the moment for deep feedback. We, we need some numbers here. Um, we will collect those. And the accounting firm, of, no, no. Uh, we have a group of folks outside who will uh, uh, collect the scores. And, uh, but to keep you amused um, and to get help, more importantly, to help you get to know our presenters, I'll be uh, having them come up here and we'll ask them a few questions and chat for just a little bit. All right. So we've got 10 presentations. Now, you're going to be able to vote. And we're going to give you detailed instructions on voting, but you can vote by phone. How cool is that? But if you don't have your phone or you don't like voting by phone or anything like that, uh, we're going to have hard copy ballots available. And we're going to do that right after the last competitor finishes, but before we have an intermission break. Okay, and so we'll give you instructions about that. Uh, at the intermission, you'll be able to go back, uh, graze a little bit of the food in the back of the room, and uh, the bar will be open. Okay, the main food is going to happen later, so you've got to wait for that. Okay. 
So I uh, now have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished panel of judges, and they are truly all distinguished, but I won't go through their, their detailed bios. So, but I am going to ask them to turn, stand around, and maybe wave as I announce your name. So I'm going to start uh, closest to me and work down the table. So closest to me, we have David Skaberg, who is the Dean of Humanities and Professor of Asian Languages and Cultures. Thank you, David. All right. Uh, next, we have Wesley Thorne, who is the director of the UCLA Career Center. So he knows something about professional development. All right. Next, I'm delighted to introduce Linda Gackray, who's a partner in Owens and Gackray and a board member of the UCLA Foundation. Thank you very much, Linda. Next, we have Catherine Atchison, who's vice provost at UCLA for new collaborative initiatives and also professor in dentistry. Okay. Working my way down my list, then we have Kim Williams, who is a consultant in governance, strategy, and leadership development. Yeah, thank you very much. And then we have Ramona Cortez Garza, who is executive director of UCLA State Government Relations. Thank you, Ramona. And then we have Professor Greg Payne, who is associate dean for the biosciences and a professor of uh, all things bio. Right? <laughs> So they've got the hard work to do, and we'll appreciate your patience during the interludes. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, also, before we get started with the first presenter, I'd like to recognize our Grad Slam co-sponsors, who are the Office of the Chancellor and the Grad Student Association, who helped us out. So thank you very much for your support. And one last bit of recognition. I want to recognize two grad students who were finalists last year in the Grad Slam. And they were so gracious in agreeing to provide some help to this year's con uh, contestants and to reach out to our new students. They both came back. They helped uh, with our information sessions. Uh, they demoed their presentations and they answered questions from the student attendees who were still thinking about whether they'd enter Grad Slam. And I, I'm going to give them a special thanks because this year we have many more competitors than last year. So clearly they did their job really well. We have small gifts for them. Uh, the first one is for Sarah Hurstman, who was the third place finisher and the Audience Choice Award winner last year from the Neuroscience Interdepartmental Program and in Psychology. So, Sarah. And second, we have Oscar Campos, who is one of our finalists for Molecular Biology. So whether you're a student who's presenting today, a member of our judging panel, or an observer, we appreciate your coming to support these brave and brilliant students. So we're going to turn our attention to why we're here this evening, to hear from our grad students and our first presenter. And by the clock, will only start once they start talking, so we don't count the walk-up time. It's not like the Oscars, the music is playing. Okay. Our first presenter is uh, Courtney Young from Molecular Biology who will be talking about an end to Duchenne gene editing for muscular dystrophy. Courtney. was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy when he was two and a half years old and I was a senior in high school all set to become an engineer. But this changed everything. Can you imagine being a young boy, becoming weaker while your friends are becoming stronger? This is what happens in Duchenne. Duchenne primarily affects boys, about one in 5,000, and it results in progressive muscle weakness. Boys typically become wheelchair bound by their early teens and often don't survive their 20s. So Christopher's diagnosis was devastating for my family especially because there is currently no cure. And it caused me to change course.
from engineering to molecular biology, to be where I am today, doing research on therapies for Duchenne. We know that Duchenne is caused by mutations or changes in a region of DNA that lead to lack of a protein that normally protects muscle cells. Since we know these changes that cause Duchenne, my research are to correct those changes. This research has been made possible by bacteria. You may be wondering, how can bacteria help muscle disease? Well, recently researchers discovered a system that is present only in bacteria that has the ability to precisely cut DNA. And I am using this system to develop it as a therapy for Duchenne. It's called CRISPR-Cas9, and it's a two-component system that you can think of as flags and scissors. So the first component, these flags, we can tell to go almost anywhere in the DNA. And the second component, these scissors, will go and cut the DNA wherever there's a flag. So we can get very specific cuts in DNA in precise locations. We are using this for Duchenne. Normal DNA fits together like puzzle pieces. But in Duchenne, the mutations or the changes in the DNA result in the puzzle pieces no longer fitting together. This makes the DNA non-functional and it doesn't produce the protein. We are targeting this region of DNA where 60% of patients have mutations, which means that our strategy works for the majority of Duchenne boys. We are placing flags and using scissors to cut out this region of DNA so that the puzzle pieces fit together again, making a shorter but functional puzzle. And excitingly, we have shown that this will now produce the protein that's normally lacking in Duchenne. And even though the protein is missing a little piece, it is still able to do its job to protect muscle cells. I've already acknowledged bacteria, but my goal is to use this as a permanent reversal for Duchenne and help boys like Christopher live longer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, while the judges are doing their work, uh, let me ask you a little bit about Sure. Did you always know you wanted to be uh, an engineer or scientist, or was there something that triggered it in particular? Well, my parents, uh, my parents are engineers and scientists, so they always kind of brought me up. But they brought me up thinking I would love physics, and I really did not love physics. <laughs> <laughs> I hated physics in high school, and so I became more interested in bio. And so when I went to undergrad, I did chemical and biomolecular engineering instead of more of a hard type of engineering. But I pretty much knew I was interested in science and math from a young age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And do you plan on going on and becoming a professor somewhere? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope so, at least. Good. Well, thank you so much. Let's yeah. get another round of applause thank for you. Courtney. <laughs> and, uh, October 2nd, our judges are finishing their scoring, and in a moment, uh, someone will swoop in and pick up their score sheets. It's tough with the first time. Uh, just, you know, a little bit of explanation. You may wonder, you know, what if they give, like, certain range of scores at the beginning and afterwards they think, oh, well, I should have done that one higher or lower. We are going to give them a chance at the very end to do a little editing. Okay, so uh, so that, that, that way the first and the last, there's no disadvantage and all that kind of thing. The collectors are going to swoop in. <laughs> I should also remind people, take a moment, please, to silence your phones. <laughs> and and it, it's fine to take pictures if it's possible to your camera in the silent shutter mode. That's also totally cool. Okay, so we are almost ready. We should have seven sheets. That's fantastic.
So I'm pleased now to introduce our second finalist. She is Vic Victoria Tseng from Epidemiology, and she's going to be talking about cataract surgery and mortality in the United States population. Victoria. Stay. <laughs> Think of your eye as a camera. Just as every camera has a lens, your eye also has a lens. And when this lens gets cloudy, that's what we call a cataract. Just as a camera with a dirty lens produces distorted pictures, an eye with a cloudy lens can't see well. In fact, cataracts are the leading cause of low vision among aging adults in the United States. So clearly, we need to do something to address the vision loss from cataracts. And we do. We do cataract surgery. So if you look at the picture on the left, that's what you would see with a cataract. You can tell there's an adult and a child, but you can't see what they look like or where they are. But if you do cataract surgery, where you take out the cloudy lens and put in a clear and artificial lens, then you can see that it's me and my baby Xander, and we're on the beach. So what does this have to do with my research, aside from the fact that I think my kid is really cute? Well, I study epidemiology, which has to do with the patterns causes and effects of diseases and their treatments. So I'm interested in the disease of cataract, its treatment of cataract surgery, and their effects on our everyday lives. So let's start with what we know. We know that people who get cataract surgery can see better. Previous research has also shown us that people who can see well tend to have a lower risk of falling and breaking their bones compared to people who cannot see well. We also know that people who break bones late in life have a higher chance of dying. So I was interested in whether cataract surgery could make you live longer, potentially through this mechanism of improving your vision and reducing your risk of breaking bones, especially late in life. To study this, I looked at a database of 1.5 million Americans with Medicare insurance who were diagnosed with a cataract. I split this population into two groups, one group who got cataract surgery and the other group who had a cataract but didn't get surgery implying that their vision was poor. I then compared survival time in these two groups, but keeping in mind that I was looking at statistical associations and not causation, I had to account for several other factors that could affect survival time, such as each person's age, their ethnicity, the number and types of illnesses they have, where they live in the United States, and whether they're male or female. And after accounting for these important factors, I found that people with cataract surgery had a 45% reduced risk of dying compared to people without cataract surgery, suggesting that cataract surgery may potentially actually make us live longer. So we all know the importance of eating well and exercising to help us stay healthy, but my research suggests that taking good care of your eyes may be another important factor to consider to help us live a long and fruitful life. Thank you. Great job. So an epidemiologist, that's, a, that's not a common career. That's not something that most uh, you know, fifth graders think about becoming. So what was your path to finding your way to epidemiology? Um, it actually was not a short one. I started by going to medical school, and I was interested in the field of ophthalmology as a medical student. And um, because of that, I started doing some research with the health services division at the Veterans Hospital in my medical school. And when I started doing that, I was like, well, I can't communicate with this research team and I don't know what I'm doing here. I really need to find out more. So I'm actually part of the UCLA STAR program, which combines a PhD with residency. So I'm doing my epidemiology PhD in conjunction with ophthalmology residency here. Wow. Okay. In the meantime, you had to learn a whole lot of statistics in addition to all the biological stuff. Yes, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much. We wish you great success in your future career. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So our, our judges are writing down a set of numbers, not just one number, just so you know. But no paragraphs, people.
Okay, I think we're ready. So I'm very pleased to introduce our third finalist, and she is Shen Liang Tseng, Tseng sorry, from Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and she's going to be talking about is black carbon a culprit of the severe drought in the Western United States? This is Farmer Cha. During the recent severe drought in California, his 20 acres dried up due to his well being evaporated from the drought, being from the high heat. As a result, he lost his crops and his income. As a state, California loses up to $8 billion each year with this drought. In such a crippling condition, we asked ourselves, is it possible that a man-made air pollutant can be a culprit to this drought by reducing rainfall? In order to answer this question, we, asked, we studied the, the process between rain formation and black carbon, a major air pollutant. Black carbon is the exhaust that comes out of our coal-fired power plants, our airplanes, our diesel trucks, and our car engines. It's a special air pollutant in that it has the ability to prevent clouds from growing into rain. You see, in a clean environment, the cloud droplets that we have are full of water, which is easily grows into raindrops in humid conditions. But in a polluted environment with black carbon, these particles itself competes for that same precious water, making each, carb each cloud drop smaller. And these cloud drops that are smaller is then less likely to grow into rain. An example analogy of this is like saying we wanted to grow more trees in a certain amount of land, but we kept the amount of soil or fertilizer the same. We might end up with more trees, but those trees, only a few of them will be strong enough to bear fruit. In the current atmospheric science research field, the research on black carbon and rain formation has been for the global scale. Now, this doesn't mean that we know information for every point on the globe. This actually means that we don't know for every point on the globe or any point. For us in the Western United States, where we're suffering through this drought, this does us no good. So we need something more, and we need something more specific. So in my research, I focused on black carbon and rain formation specifically for the Western United States. We used an updated and region-specific black carbon data set coupled with a state-of-the-art weather model, like a souped-up version of the weather models that television meteorologists use to study rainfall. In doing so, we found that black carbon can actually reduce rain by up to 50% in the summer months. Now, this tells us that we must invest in clean energy and clean engines, because if we don't, farmers like Farmer Cha will continue to suffer, and in the long term, so will all of us. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Shenlong. So what made you want to uh, go into this field? Uh, was there was it something you aspired to do, you know, fascination with weather from a young age, or you know, how did you get to where you are? Um, I think it's a little bit different for me. Um, so I think uh, I like to think that atmospheric science found me rather than I found atmospheric science. Um, it just so happened that the, uh, the Air Force Fellowship was for atmospheric science. And, uh, so. Uh. <laughs> So, um, so you followed the out, money, is that what you're saying? Um, I followed the career to be an officer. Ah, yeah. 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 Um, but it turned out to be a very, uh, very interesting study and definitely very worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So do you plan on staying in the field of uh, sort of environmental impact of man-made pollutants or kind of open to different directions? Um, I think from this research, I certainly would like to, um, as uh, black carbon is the number two anthropogenic um, in most important anthropogenic emission behind CO2 and global warming. Um, I certainly think it's worthy of study, so yeah, definitely. Okay. 
So unlike CO2, though, it seems like black carbon would be easy to get rid of, right? Just take, filter it all out, right? You know, absolutely, but I think there's a, with black carbon, because it's tied to so many of our, our engine systems that we see, you know, all the transportation and our energy, um, it's really difficult to get rid of all of that. Um, so I think really, it really, we have to put all hands on deck in looking at um, clean energy and engine systems. Um, but that's gonna take a global effort, like I say. You know, it's really gonna take all of us. So if you have friends who are driving cars with mufflers that are belching out black <laughs> stuff, I gave Get him a new muffler. I gave him an earful. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much. ready for contestant number four. And he is Alexander Thiel from Mechanical Engineering. And he's going to tell us about phase change materials for energy efficient buildings. Okay. Good evening. The California Energy Commission has established ambitious goals that all new residential construction should be zero net energy by the year 2020 and all new commercial construction by the year 2030. Now what is zero net energy? This represents a balance between the value generated and consumed by a building measured in economic or physical terms. Value might be generated by solar panels or windmills. It might be consumed by turning on the lights, plugging in an appliance or heating and cooling the building. The goal of our research is to reduce the energy required to heat and cool the building by reducing the amount of heat that enters the building during the daytime and leaves the building again at nighttime. This is accomplished by adding phase change materials to the building walls. So we're going to talk about a phase change material that everybody here is familiar with, water. Consider a glass of water sitting at room temperature. Now imagine that we can cool this water down to where it's at its freezing temperature but still liquid. This involves a certain amount of energy. Now, if we were to continue freezing the water so that it turns from liquid to solid or changes phase, this involves about four times the amount of energy than simply cooling down the water. What's more, that happens at a nearly constant temperature. It's this large energy storage at constant temperature that we want to leverage in buildings. So returning to our building from earlier, let's add phase change materials to the building walls, something that melts and freezes near room temperature, like paraffin wax. In this case, when heat hits the building during the daytime, instead of coming straight through the wall, it's stored as the phase change material melts. In the evening, the material solidifies and releases that heat back into the house. As a result, less energy is required to heat and cool the building on a daily basis. Now this energy storage, the amount of energy savings that we get depends on a variety of factors, including the type and amount of PCM used, and also the location of the building. The state of California can be divided into 16 zones, each with their own unique climate. My research has shown that the annual energy savings associated with adding phase change materials to building walls tends to be larger in moderate climates like Los Angeles than in colder climates like San Francisco or hotter climates like Fresno. I predicted these values using computer simulations that took several hours to run. The cool part is I've now come up with an algorithm that can perform these calculations in just a matter of seconds. This has already been implemented into building simulation software designed here at UCLA. The speed and simplicity of that software could allow it to be developed for use on tablets or smartphones. The users might have questions, such as how much energy might be required to heat and cool my building? How much might that be reduced if I add phase change materials to the walls? How much money might I save on my electricity bill as a result? The answers to those questions and many more could be at your fingertips in the near future. The vision here is that building designers and homeowners will be able to consider the benefits of phase change materials when they're dreaming up the zero net energy buildings of California's future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. So are you from California originally? I'm not. I'm actually from northern Arizona, up in the mountains. Northern Arizona. So um, you have lots of different microclimates there and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, would this work better in the desert, better in the mountains, or the in-betweens where there's transitions? It's the in-betweens. Um, so really, you know, places that stay hot all the time doesn't work so well. Places that stay cold all the time, it doesn't work so well. So you're looking for somewhere that has that sort of middle variation both seasons. Okay. 
-huh. now, now, did you always want to be an engineer? You know, I was, I was a Lego kid. I think a lot of us were Lego kids. And that was when I got to high school. You know, I, I liked putting things together, finding out how they worked. And I was great at math. So <laughs> kind of pointed me at engineering. Very nice. Right. So, so are you going to well, start a company based on this once you get I'd done? love to start a company one day. Not right away. I'm looking to go into industry or perhaps into business consulting, actually. So. Business consulting. Okay. Adding value in a different way. Right. Exactly. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much, Alexander. Good You're welcome. Day. Thank you. Are we done at this end? You guys gave yours in already? Okay. Okay. So we're approaching our halfway point. Our fifth finalist is Erica Onuga from English. She's going to talk about when forced labor leaves no time to parent. Imagine you're one of the 40% of Americans who works a non-traditional job with unpredictable hours, and you have kids. What are your childcare options? For many parents, the only option is a 24-hour daycare, a fast-growing segment of the childcare industry. Even the most ambitious plan for childcare that only focuses on affordability will still exclude these workers who also need flexible daycare hours. Child care is just one example of the often invisible ways that working conditions can influence or even dictate parenting decisions. But what happens when people are forced to work and have zero control over their working conditions? We don't have to wonder because we know from studying American slavery. In my research, I try to understand how slave mothers describe finding time to nurture their kids despite being forced to work incessantly with days that often began before dawn and ended after dusk before they went home to perform even more domestic work. In the first person account that I study in slave narratives, I found that slavery actively prevented slave mothers from providing the maternal care they so desperately wanted to give to their children. Specifically, I found that slavery created a kind of competition for the times of slave mothers. On the one hand, they had to work as much as humanly possible or face near certain horrific physical violence. At the same time, they tried to find hidden moments to nurture and care for their children. In just one example, a slave mother was forced to breastfeed her baby and her mistress's baby simultaneously. When there were concerns about the mistress's baby getting sufficient milk, the slave mother was forced to prematurely wean her own child. So when her role as a forced laborer conflicted with her role as a mother, she had to ignore the needs of her own baby. Now my research into the unique ways that gender and motherhood affected the narrated laboring time of slaves is a vastly understudied area. Although time in African American studies is a vastly growing subfield in English, most studies focus exclusively on the experiences of slave men. Now my research is among the first to look at the experiences of women and mother, and hopefully I can rectify some of this gender disparity, which will lead to more thorough, well-balanced research. But more broadly, my research shows just how much influence working conditions can have over personal life decisions. 
And while absolutely nothing can compare to the horror of slavery, studying the brutal effects of slavery on individuals and families will hopefully lead to less judgment of individuals whose life circumstances may be dramatically different than our own. Like the working families living in homeless shelters in tent cities across America, or the working families who rely on 24-hour daycares to keep their jobs. This research may inspire more empathy for and dialogue with the most vulnerable and marginalized families in our communities, and that's what leads to better, more effective policy decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, oh, Erica. Yes. I, I think uh, your research topic must resonate with uh, students in the audience, uh, whether or not they're parents, because they're working very hard, but, but grad students who are parents, uh, I'm not drawing an analogy to slavery, but they do work very, very long hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would concede that, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think what's interesting is that, and the, one of the draws for me was that I think so often if you think about like policy debates, we talk about individual choices without really thinking about the larger structural frameworks that impact and can even determine the, the decisions that people make. So if we really want to make an impact, we have to look at both personal decisions and the structural factors. So that's what I was trying to get at here. So how did you find yourself doing this particular research project? <laughs> that is an interesting question. I'm sure my chair has it too. Um, well. <laughs> It's been a long evolution. Um, I really, I was drawn to African American studies and African American literature, um, but I just, I was really surprised that, one, we had this kind of fast growing subfield in literary studies, like time in American, not even just in African American literature, but in, in American literary studies is this huge growing subfield. It's kind of dominating things and it's been that way for a few years. But if you look at African American um, literature, the focus is almost always on men. So my research was looking at women, and I just kept finding all of these examples where the, the experiences of women completely contradicted the existing theory. So it was kind of an obvious um, entry point into it. And it, it's interesting because sometimes I meet with my advisors, and they're like, how has no one done this? And I say, I don't know, but it, it's clearly there. So that's why I think focusing on rectifying these disparities is so important so that we have better research that really accounts for the breadth of experience. So I think yours is a great example of a graduate student forging the path to innovative research at UCLA. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. I think our audience is gaining an appreciation of how quickly three minutes goes by. <laughs> Thank you, judges. I'm now pleased to introduce Samantha Mikhail from Radiological Sciences, who will tell us about innovative real-time imaging for MRI-guided interventions. Samantha. Imagine a maze, one of those large haystack mazes you may see in fall time. There's an entrance, there's an exit, and your job is to get through as fast as possible without getting stuck in an obstacle. That's what interventional radiology is like. There's an entry point somewhere along the body, and the target is a tumor or a lesion somewhere in the liver or the kidney, and the interventionalist wants to get through as fast as possible. But this time, the stakes are a little higher. If they hit something, you can cause major damage to the patient. This is where image guidance comes into play. Image guidance is kind of like a GPS that helps the interventionalists know where they want to go. In the past, ultrasound and CT were the two main modalities used for interventional radiology. 
Ultrasound, though, you could only see about three centimeters in at any point in time. So it becomes really difficult for the interventionalist to get into deeper regions. CT, on the other hand, you can see the entire body, but there's increased dose to both the patient and the radiologist, so you can't image at long periods of time. Therefore, my lab is looking at using MRI or magnetic resonance imaging to be able to see the body through all stages of breathing cycles, cardiac motions, and be able to image with no radiation dose. However, this isn't widely used yet because there's still a lot of limitations. It's time consuming. There's device contrast issues, so you can't always see what you need to see. And also, the bore, which is this circular part, is, tends to be kind of small, so it's difficult for radiologists to reach in. My main research is working on ways to improve this real-time imaging. So in the past, there was issues with contrast when you try doing real-time. So here you can see it's bright near the liver, but here you can't really see that spot anymore. Also, there's artifact issues, which is signal voids, which you can kind of see it's black lines over there. So what I did is took the best parts of each of these sequences and created a new sequence that has high contrast and no artifacts here through the liver. And you can kind of see it shows a whole breathing cycle, breathing in and breathing out. You're able to visualize all parts of the cycle as well as the cardiac motion in the top. But if this is all I had to do, I would have my PhD by now, which isn't the case. One other main part that we have to work on is the small bore issue. I mentioned that it's really small in here, only about 60 centimeters, but it's also very long. So physicians have issues reaching in and doing all of these interventions. Therefore, we're working with mechanical engineering to build an MRI-compatible compa robotic system that actually goes in with the patients, and the physician can stay outside and remotely manipulate the robotic so it can reach the part using just the imaging that I'm created, creating as well as the actuation so they can reach the goal and be able to get through their maze. Thank you. Thank you so much. So did you always have in mind that you would want a career that would lead you towards uh, sort of the engineering side or human health impact? Growing up, I actually always wanted to be an oncologist or some sort of doctor, but just kind of reading more about it, I decided I wanted to help out in another way where I can reach more people at like one point in time. So I started going more towards engineering until my junior year of biomedical engineering undergrad where I learned about medical imaging and medical physics. So I'm actually getting my degree in biomedical physics right now. So where does that lead? Do you, will you find yourself uh, doing uh, more inventions of innovative things? Or uh, would you like to go into some kind of uh, more clinical setting? I honestly have no idea yet. So I have done a couple of internships with industry. And I'm also working on rotations with clinical. And I'm kind of interested in everything. So we'll see when I finally graduate what I'm actually interested in. <laughs> This is the fun part. Uh, it might be the first person who offers you a job. We don't know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Well, thank you so much. Right. Thank Lisa. you so much. Imagine the job of the judges is getting harder as they're having to sort of interpolate and put together all these different things we've heard. So we'll see. <gasps> By the way, these judging breaks are a great time to tweet or other things. Public service message, yes, tweet your friends. <laughs> we are going to post uh, videos uh, online, I think, so. Okay. All right. Good. A question from the judges panel. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question was, did we uh, group the uh, contestants by discipline? Uh, and the answer is no. It was random. 
However, we did notice some self-selection in our semifinal rounds. Uh, what we found was that the people from the South Campus, so the scientists, the engineers, gravitated to the morning. <laughs> and there was some clustering of people from the North Campus in the afternoon. But we, we in uh, ranking them, we put them together as, as one big pool. So <laughs> Okay, we're all done? We're ready to go? Fantastic. I am pleased to introduce candidate number six, up, whatever we're at. Uh, <laughs> Nerv Makaspak from Geography, building among indigenous peoples in the Cordillera region of the Philippines. For over 25 years, there have been no documented cases of civilian deaths, internal displacement, or involuntary migration related to the five-decade-long armed conflict between the Philippine state and a Maoist rebel group called the New People's Army, or NPA, within the indigenous municipality of Sagada in the Cordillera region in the northern Philippines. Leaders of Sagada attribute this to the peace zone, a term they used to refer to a local ban on the entry of the Philippine military and the rebel groups within their community, a ban that they declared following the conflict-related deaths of three children in 1988. In contrast to many indigenous communities in the Philippines, the indigenous peoples of Sagada have effectively rejected military operations, refused rebel presence, and disarmed the municipal police. In my research, the puzzle I seek to understand is this. How do indigenous peoples of Sagada maintain the peace zone and protect civilian lives amid decades of armed conflict? Existing research defines peace zones as demilitarized geographic areas or neutral communities. My research reveals that neither of these approaches adequately explain how a peace zone actually works. In Sagada, indigenous peoples have to constantly negotiate with the armed groups to maintain the legitimacy of the peace zone, not as a way out of the conflict, but rather as a way into the conflict by asserting their rights as a party equally affected by the armed conflict. My research is a case of local peace building that specifically manifests through a collective refusal and resistance to war. While I focus in the Philippines, my findings have broad impact on policy making in the protection of civilian populations in over 40 ongoing armed conflicts all around the world today. In addition, my research contributes to our understanding of indigenous peace building, an emerging theme of the United Nations and the main agenda of this year's upcoming General Assembly of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. I use the term insurgent peace to reconceptualize peace beyond its dominant definition as the absence of violence, to better understand the everyday processes that civilian populations do to protect their lives amid ongoing armed conflict by transforming their political relationships with competing structures of power. And what might these tell us about agency, autonomy, and peace? Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, sir. So have you had a chance to travel to the Philippines or other countries as part of your research? Absolutely. I was there in uh, summer 2014, um, funded by my ge with the Geography Department Summer Research um, Travel Grant. And I did uh, three, work, uh, three months of um, ethnographic field work. And I did over 60 interviews and also conducted participatory observation. Um, it's kind of tough to be out there because um, there's only one road to go to the village and it's like 12 hour bus ride from Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines. And even if it's a peace zone, it's also a war zone, as I've mentioned. Um, so it's kind of a tough field site to be in. I imagine. So uh, where do you, what do you see yourself doing five or ten years from now? I would love to be a professor at the University of California. Hello. <laughs> um, I did my master's at Berkeley and now I'm currently here at UCLA doing my PhD. Um, so I would love to stick to the university, if that's possible. I'm trying to understand, you understand peace uh, 
Bears or Bruins? Bruins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although, a, na a natural peacemaker. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank Appreciate you so much. It. Thank you. <laughs> We're approaching our final three. And the excitement will build. And don't forget, you're going to vote too. So I hope you've been sort of keeping a little mental track, making some notes on your program, thinking, hmm, who's my number one? And by the way, you will only have one chance to vote. So. You have to vote very carefully. Think carefully. You don't get, it's not like redo. It's not like, I don't know, American Idol or The Voice where you get to like vote early and often. You get one shot here. So, vote is to count. has almost all of our, you have all of them? Okay, almost, up, oh, two left. And there's one lying down there, I think, so. Great, okay. Home stretch, so I am very pleased. You're on your mic already, okay. Pleased to introduce Gary Lee from Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, who's going to tell us about traveling to Mars with immortal plasma rockets. <laughs> to send humans to Mars, we need a revolutionary rocket technology. This is the Saturn V rocket that launched astronauts to the moon. It is the largest rocket ever built, larger than even the Statue of Liberty. This rocket requires an enormous amount of fuel in order to send this relatively tiny spacecraft into orbit. And from there, it takes even more fuel to send the spacecraft to the moon. As you can see, Traditional rocket technology is not very fuel efficient. So how do you get to Mars, which is 200 times further away than the moon? The answer is an ultra fuel efficient technology called electric propulsion, or plasma rockets. By replacing the old rocket technology on the spacecraft with modern plasma rockets, such as this Hall thruster or ion thruster, this spacecraft can get to the moon with one tenth this tank of fuel. Or seen another way, this tank of fuel can get you to Mars. So why haven't we gone to Mars yet? Well, these plasma thrusters must operate for many years for a Mars mission. Imagine what would happen if you left your car on for a few years. It would break, and so will your plasma thruster if you run it long enough. So what's the solution? Make sure it doesn't break. <laughs> to do this, we have to understand how a plasma thruster works. The thruster creates a plasma, which is a soup of positive particles called ions and negative particles called electrons. These ions are shot out the back of the spacecraft, pushing the spacecraft forward. Simple enough, right? But what happens when this plasma gets close to the walls of the thruster? When an ion hits the wall, a piece breaks off. And if enough ions hit the wall, eventually the wall will break, potentially causing the thruster to explode. But what if there was an effect where the pieces that break off turn around and go back to the wall repairing itself. Could something like this actually happen? Yes, this effect called plasma redeposition can magically repair the walls of your thruster, making it unbreakable. For my research, I create a plasma and smash it against different wall materials with microarchitectured surfaces in order to maximize this plasma redeposition effect. So far, I found that I can double the lifetime of current thruster materials. That can make the difference between getting to Mars and getting stuck halfway. My end goal is to design a thruster that can last 10 times as long, making it effectively immortal. Such a thruster 
would solve the fuel inefficiency of traditional rockets and enable us to travel to Mars. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm talking to a rocket scientist here. Kind of. Kind of. Okay. So did you always want to be an engineer? No. So originally I didn't want to go to engineering on purpose. So I went to Berkeley for undergrad, and then I came in as an astrophysicist. But then I was like, okay, I love space, but do I want to look had a telescope every day for the rest of my life from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. drinking coffee, so I can't do it. <laughs> so one day I decided to, you know, change my career. So senior year, I think this was like near the very end. Um, the summer before, I did an internship in Texas on basically modeling plasma rockets, um, and I learned about it. I was like, I've always wanted to be a rocket scientist, but I think what would be even cooler is to be a plasma rocket scientist. So. I decided, you know, I'm not going to be an astrophysicist anymore, and I applied to uh, plasma physics. Well, this is plasma physics slash aerospace engineering grad school. Yeah, so I guess if you were to call me something, um, I guess I'm an applied plasma physicist, rocket scientist. <laughs> Would you ever want to be an astronaut? Uh, no, so that's a good question, because NASA just released um, their, uh, their most previous application round, and they actually got the most amount of applicants in the last, I think, 30 years of soliciting astronauts. And the reason why is because everyone wants to go to Mars. Because I can send them there on my plasma rockets. But, <laughs> but the reason why I don't want to be an astronaut is because I can barely ride roller coasters. And apparently, rockets are like roller coasters on steroids with more steroids. So yeah, I can't be an astronaut. <laughs> but I'm, I'd be happy to send Matt Damon to Mars. If he wants great. to. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're down to our final two. Final two. Our judges are going to be exhausted soon. It's only ten. It's only ten. And be, be thinking about your audience choice favorite. You know, your decision moment is going to come very, very soon. Okay. We are ready to introduce Mayank Jog from Bioengineering, who's going to tell us about imaging electrical currents. Before we start, um, am I audible? Okay. Yeah. And I just want to confirm you can see my slides from there, right? Okay. So I'm going to try and stay within this line. Okay, let's get it started then. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about imaging electric currents. Why image electric currents? Well, so during the last decade, tiny electric currents have been found to be therapeutic for patients suffering from depression, chronic pain, drug cravings, Parkinson's disease, among others. This technique is known as transcranial direct current stimulation, and I'd like to draw your attention to its abbreviation, TDCS, which I'll be using frequently. So a typical TDCS setup, shown here on the left, uses a nine volt battery together with a pair of sponges placed on the head to deliver a tiny electric current through the brain. So this technique is non-invasive, seems to work for many clinical applications, and has grown exponentially, as shown in the middle figure. So in 2015, a clinical TDCS paper was published every other day. But we don't know how this works. And this is really frustrating, because TDCS could be the magic bullet for brain disorders. So we know it works, but we don't know how it works. And one way to understand how TDCS works would be to photograph the TDCS electric currents in the brain. This has never been done before, and that's why I'm really excited to talk to you about my research on imaging electric currents. So how is this done? So just like a pebble in water creates ripples, electric current creates magnetic ripples. 
So in the top figure here, if we can figure out the source of the ripples, we'd know where the pebble is. Similarly, in the bottom figure, if we can figure out the source of the magnetic ripples, shown here by the blue color abruptly changing to red, we'd know where the electric current is. So visualizing TDCS electric currents in the brain using magnetic ripples is my contribution to the TDCS field. And you can see it in action in the figure on the top left. So going forward, I want to use electricity imaging to photograph where in the brain do the TDCS currents go. This information can be used to figure out which TDCS setup is safer and more effective, for instance, between the two setups shown on the top right. In this way, I want to use electricity imaging to determine the safest and most effective setups and thus help this 9-volt battery-powered non-invasive TDCS shown here on the left mature into a viable, low-cost, and high-impact clinical treatment. Thank you for your attention. Good job. So I'm thinking nine volt battery, a couple sponges, can you buy it on the internet? Oh, you sure can. That's, really? uh, that's, that, that, that's part of the thing. So that's part of the thing that attracted me to TDCS because it's very low cost and I mean, I'm not trying to sell it. We still need to figure out how it works. But if it does work, it can have a big impact because it's low cost, easy to use. You can send a patient home with it. Do we know? We can't see it. Yeah. Um, uh, until, is, now. It, until now. Until now, <laughs> yes. Of course, of course. Um, it, is, there a, is it pretty advanced that people understand where to put the electrodes, or is it just kind of good here, I don't know. <laughs> so, 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 the, so the science behind that is you, you're trying to target certain areas in the brain. And you, you use like mathematical models and stuff, but you still want like a validation. Like you, you need validation before you deploy it clinically. Is it safe or, you know. So that's, that's where we come in. Right. Yeah. Kind of like to know like nine volt battery, car battery, you know, how much juice do you need? Right? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't please don't plug car batteries to your head. I, I don't want that to be the take home. <laughs> Did you always want to be an engineer? Yes. Um, well, I, I wanted to. I have this disposition of like if I see a problem, I, I think about why can't we fix it, and that sort of took me over into engineering where we start doing that for a living. As opposed to politics, but anyway. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much, Ryan. I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. So those who want to vote by phone, you can uh, get your phones out. Don't turn your sound on yet. You won't need that. Because um, we're going after our last speaker, we'll give you our, your voting instructions. And uh, then you can go out and have some refreshments for a few minutes. So, um, so we are ready. So waiting patiently is our last finalist. He is Philip Bulteris from Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics, who's going to tell us about Disarming Deadly Bacteria. <laughs> For these rice farmers in Southeast Asia, this is just another day at work. But the tranquility of the scene masks a grim reality. The soil and water in which these farmers are standing is teeming with a deadly bacteria known as Burkholderia. If as few as 10 of these bacteria enter a cut on your foot or inhaled into your lungs, they can trigger an overwhelming infection that not even our best antibiotics can treat. One in two of these patients will die in a matter of days. The goal of my research is to find new and better treatments for this devastating disease. Burkholderia kills almost 100,000 patients, people every year, throughout tropical regions of the world. 
But it's not just a global health threat, it's also a threat to our national security. In World Wars I and II, Burkle Dairy was used as a biological weapon. In the lab, we exercise extreme caution when working with Burkle Dairy and in the field because this is a scary pathogen. But the scariest thing about Burkle Dairy is that our best defenses against it are antibiotics that were developed over 40 years ago and are no longer effective today because of drug resistance. To make matters worse, uh, the development of new antibiotics has severely dwindled. We are desperately in need of new and better antibiotics for Burkholderia as well as many other bacterial infections. For the past four years, I've been working on a new strategy to combat Burkholderia. It works by targeting the weapons that Burkholderia uses to cause disease. For instance, Burkholderia is capable of firing molecular missiles into human cells. One of these missiles is, is able to cause human cells to fuse together by the thousands, as shown in this time-lapse video. And ultimately, they burst and die. This is what causes disease. If we can find a way to neutralize this weapon, we may be able to cure the disease. To test this hypothesis, we developed a simple test in my lab uh, for cell fusion, in which we engineered human cells to glow either red or green. We mix them together, and when we infect them, they fuse together and turn yellow as shown here. I used this simple approach to test over 200,000 chemical compounds for their ability to block fusion. I was able to identify 20 compounds which successfully and potently block this process, four of which are safe for use in humans. I have shown that these four compounds target essential weaponry that Burkle Daria uses to cause disease, including the molecular missile I just showed. We're currently developing these four promising compounds into new antibiotics to treat Burkholderia and potentially other bacterial infections as well. Because Burkholderia is just one of many bacteria for which we have no good antibiotics. So we're hopeful that our study could serve as a model for the development of a new generation of antibiotics that disarm deadly bacteria and save lives. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, so do you see yourself going into the pharmaceutical industry or research um, career in academics? What's, what's up? I've always dreamed of um, doing outbreak investigations, actually. Ooh. So that's been my goal since I was a child. But this, this work has definitely piqued my interest in pharmaceutical, drug development. Um, so yeah. Sounds very exciting. So, so have you, you've traveled to some of these parts of the world where the... Yeah. So I've traveled a number of times to Southeast Asia to visit colleagues who are working on Burkhold area. Mm -hmm. um, and when you visit, you really get a sense of how big a problem it is. Um, they see patients die every day of this disease. Wow, so. very good. Well, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate joining us. All right. So, so while the judges are, are doing their final things, uh, let's give all of our students a round of applause and congratulate them on a job well done. Okay. All right. So I, I think we might be able to, if we have our house lights go up a little bit, that'd be great. But if not, um, we'll live with them the way they are. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the audience choice judging. So if we can get that slide up for us. Um, we'll see. So uh, here's how it's, what's going to happen next. We have about a 15-minute intermission, uh, and we'll put off a chime when you got like a couple minutes to go. Uh, but you're only going to have five minutes, five minutes to do your audience choice vote. So we'll have a timer, a sound will go off when there's 30 seconds left. All right. So there are your instructions. You're going to have five minutes. I hope everyone can see it from here. Everyone can see the numbers. Okay. Here it is. Um, so uh, let's see what else I need to tell you. Follow directions, vote for your favorite speaker. You only get to vote once, so vote carefully. Now, if you don't want to vote by phone, uh, at this time, raise your hand and just keep it up. April, Mike, and Sophia will give you a ballot and pencil. So we have some folks back there, um, and we'll have some people coming around. With I see April walking around, and some others. And just keep it up until you get a paper ballot. Once you have placed your vote, vote, or just tell you can just hand your paper back to one of those three people. Uh, go grab a bite, get a drink, come on back in the room, chat, take a bio break. The restrooms are just outside to the left here. Uh, one this side, one the other side. 
So uh, we'll have some uh, munchies and some, uh, some drinks, and then we'll bring you back into the room. We'll announce the winners, and then we'll have an open reception, okay?
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We are ready to begin to announce what you've all been waiting to hear. Okay, come on back in. We'll wait for all of, uh, all of our contestants to have a seat. And I'm going to wait for my, uh, my Vanna White to help me out here in a moment. Okay, well, I hope you're all enjoying food, and there will be uh, more after this. So uh, if you're not satiated yet, no worries. We'll go back to the food in a second. But we have something more important to do first. We're going to start uh, by... We're going to start by acknowledging and celebrating all of our student contestants by presenting each of them with a Grad Slam 2016 finalist certificate. And uh, here are some instructions for our contestants. So when I call your name, you're going to I'd ask you to come to the podium, and uh, we'll present this. But then I'd ask you to maybe stay on the podium. So we'll just kind of queue you all up, all ten. I think we can fit, uh, and just stay there. And then once you're all assembled, we will announce the winners. Okay. So, uh, I have to go back to my program, which has now disappeared. Oh, here we go. So, we'll start with uh, Courtney Young. Thank you for participating. <laughs> and Victoria Tsang. They're also getting a little $50 gift card. So, uh, Yeah, for, forget the paper, you know. <laughs> uh, Shen Long Tseng, And Alexander Thiel. <laughs> and Erica Onuga. And Samantha Mikhail. <laughs> and Nerve Makaspek. And Gary Lee. <laughs> and my uncle Jog. And Philip Matera. <laughs> so they're all winners, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. So our judges had a ridiculously hard time, and I hope the audience, uh, you also had a hard time, right? Okay. The audience choice winner 
Uh, I don't even know. What are we giving away this year? What are they winning? They get a plaque. And what? Else? And they get something else? Oh, okay. Okay, so the audience choice winner gets 500 bucks and a plaque. A very cool plaque, by the way. And the audience choice winner is Courtney Young. Don't go away because the third place winner is Courtney Young. <laughs> that's another thousand bucks. Okay. Our second place winner, who will get a lovely plaque? And $2,000 is Philip Buteris. <laughs> and our grand prize winner, who gets the lovely plaque. And $3,000 and a free trip to Northern California to compete as UCLA's representatives to the UC-wide Grad Slam competition. It is Gary Lee. Fabulous. Thank you so much. These will be available uh, on video on demand or something. You can see all this stuff. Uh, tweet, Twitter, do whatever, Snapchat, Instagram, do it all. Give a shout out to these fabulous, fabulous students. <laughs> They're going to do their photo op. That ends our program. Please enjoy the reception. Thank you all so much for coming and making our event so special. And thanks to our judges. Thank you.